All right, can you see my slides? Yes. <clears throat> All right, so I'm talking today about sleep. And first, I'm just going to touch on some basics of sleep and then spend most of the talk on sleep deprivation and its consequences. And we'll briefly look at the ACGME guidelines on duty hours, as well as the UT Southwestern policy on fatigue mitigation. And um, we'll have some questions at the end if you have any. And I chose this talk, um, one, because we have all sorts of pictures of sleeping residents that I thought needed to be shared. Um, two, because I read this book recently, Why We Sleep. And um, I think it really kind of opened my eyes about how important sleep is and bring in your perspective of, you know, especially post-call and things like that. And no sleep talk would be complete without mentioning this Libby Zion case. So Libby Zion, she was a college freshman in um, 1984. She went to a New York emergency room and uh, she was already on a psychiatric medication and was administered a different psychiatric medication in the emergency room. And um, ultimately she died of cardiopulmonary arrest from serotonin syndrome. And it was kind of not the best death. She was put in restraints beforehand. And um, her dad was a lawyer and you know, sued the hospital system here. And they made national news. And ultimately in the verdict, they um, blamed her death on you know, lack of resident supervision and also sleep deprivation of the residents. Um, in fact, the second year resident who'd been taking care of her um, was, had been working an 18-hour shift. And so we'll, we'll circle back to this at the end. So the first question I wanted to answer is, what is sleep? So it's a natural temporary state of rest when an organism becomes physically inactive and relatively unaware of the surrounding environment. So this is illustrated here. You can see Donald um, has no idea what's going on around him. He is clearly asleep. And what's interesting is every single animal that has been studied in detail has some form and fashion of sleep. Uh, it may look a little differently, but you know, mammals, reptiles, birds, even insects, they all sleep. Um, this illustration shows how the different amounts animals may sleep. So you know, giraffes and elephants only sleep a few hours per night. The brown bat will sleep you know, nearly 20 hours per night. <clears throat> There's actually one organism that can sleep even longer, 22 hours in one sitting, closely related to the brown Milla on a post-call weekend. And then this is just kind of a fun fact, but this is the bottlenose dolphin, which has this unique ability of sleeping with only one half of their brain at a time. So the dolphin is always swimming, it never stops. And in order to do that, one side of the brain stays awake while the other can sleep and they can flip flop. Can we get the residents to start doing that? We can try. And so that leads us to this next question about why do we sleep? You know, every single organism or animal, I should say, sleeps. So why do we do this? Because evolutionarily speaking, it doesn't make a lot of intuitive sense at first glance. You know, when you're sleeping, you're not looking for food, you're not looking for a mate, and you're also pretty defenseless. You know, if you're not interacting with your environment, you know, a bear could easily walk up to AJ and eat him. And for a long time, researchers looked for some, you know, single universal reason about why we sleep. Um, but really, it's kind of more universally accepted now that there's just a whole host of reasons for the mind and the body. And we're going to go through a lot of these different things, um, cognition, memory, your mental and physical performance, the immune system, and um, especially in humans, emotional regulation, as well as creativity. <clears throat> and some experiments even show that sleep is essential for life. So this was a study in the late 1980s by a guy. He had um, rats that he implanted with EEGs. And in these experimental rats, anytime they tried to fall asleep, as shown on the EEG, it would rattle the floor of their cage and make them wake up. So he totally sleep deprived these rats. And what he found was they started to do terribly. So after a couple of weeks of total sleep deprivation, their fur became matted. They developed all sorts of skin lesions and skin infections. Uh, they actually increased their food intake, yet their body weight continued to go down. Uh, they could no longer thermoregulate. They became hypothermic. And um, 
by one month, they all died or the researchers just sacrificed them because they were on the brink of death. <clears throat> and you can't really do this experiment on humans because that would be pretty unethical. Um, but there is this disease called fatal familial insomnia, um, which basically creates this. So it's a prion disease um, that selectively destroys the thalamus. And the thalamus is pretty important in sleep regulation. So people with this disease you know, end up um, not being able to sleep at all. And as the name implies, they all succumb to this. And that leads us to the next question about how do we sleep? So this um, little video I'm showing you here is a plant called the Mimosa pudica. And when you touch this plant, the leaves close down like you see here. And what's interesting is this plant will also do this depending on whether it's daytime or nighttime. And for a long time, people just assumed the plant was responding to direct sunlight. The sunlight would hit the leaves and it would tell the plant to open up. Um, but some smart guy in the 1700s uh, put this to the test. So he put this plant in a box and he would just occasionally peer at the plant to see what it was doing. And lo and behold, uh, during daylight hours, the plant's leaves would be wide open, yet it was not getting any sunlight. And then at nighttime, it would close down and would continue to cycle like this. This is the first experiment showing that organisms have some sort of internal clock. Humans, we know this as our circadian rhythm. And it's controlled largely by our suprachiasmatic nucleus in the brain. And it does respond to certain um, external factors. We know how light affects our melatonin secretion and that contributes to our sleep. But uh, just like the plant, we don't actually have to have sunlight to maintain a circadian rhythm. Some researchers um, themselves went into mammoth cave for over 30 days and received no sunlight during that time. And they found that their um, sleep-wake cycles continued to be pretty regular. You know, they would be awake 15, 16 hours and sleep a normal amount. They measured some physiologic functions as well, like their body temperature, and those continued to cycle regularly. <clears throat> Your circadian rhythm contributes to this phenomenon we know of jet lag. So if you travel, especially um, in an eastward direction and you're changing a bunch of time zones, the clock on the wall may be very different than what your internal biological clock is telling you and you can um, experience this jet lag phenomenon. So here's some smart residents getting a nap on a plane trying to prevent some serious jet lag. Other than the circadian rhythm, which is kind of the main wake drive that we have, um, there's also this sleep pressure, um, which has a lot to do with adenosine. So as you are awake, you build up adenosine in your brain. And this adenosine will bind to certain receptors on parts of the brain, um, especially in the basal forebrain. And the downstream process is, is to make you feel sleepy and fatigued. And it's really only during sleep, specifically slow wave sleep, when the astrocytes take back up this adenosine and kind of um, eliminate the sleep pressure that you feel. Something we all know and love is caffeine. Um, this is um, a large part of how caffeine works. You can see the structural similarity between caffeine. When you drink coffee or tea or whatever, it can um, bind to those adenosine receptors, displace that adenosine, and uh, prevent those downstream effects of making you feel sleepy. And fortunately, I do have a video of um, sleep pressure and acne. Powerful stuff. So we can put the circadian rhythm and the sleep pressure processes together on a graph and uh, go through this. So at 7 a.m., if you wake up, you know, your circadian rhythm, rhythm is starting to peak. And again, this is your wake drive. And then as you stay awake, your, the solid black line, the adenosine sleep pressure starts to rise. And at 11 p.m., you've been awake all day. Um, your sleep pressure is kind of at its peak. And then your circadian rhythm is troughing. So you have this big delta between the two um, pro producing a strong urge to sleep. And then when you're waking up in the morning at 7 a.m., you've purged that adenosine from your brain, the sleep pressure is gone, and your wake drive is starting to come up. So you wake up and the, the process can repeat itself. 
So this is what happens if you pull an all-nighter. So you don't go to sleep at all. <clears throat> See, at night, that first night at 11 p.m., you have that strong urge to sleep. So, you know, if you push through, you have a busy night of call and you're not able to sleep at all. Um, you may experience a little bit of a second wind phenomenon. You can see that in midday, the delta between the two lines actually decreases. So your adenosine keeps building up, their sleep pressure keeps going up, but your circadian rhythm kind of comes to your rescue a little bit. The wake drive is at its peak during midday, telling you to be awake and alert, um, and you get a little bit of a second wind. But we know it's not permanent. Again, when nighttime hits again, circadian rhythm is at its trough, and now you have a really huge overpowering urge to sleep. <clears throat> so that brings us to kind of the second part of the talk when we're going to um, talk about sleep deprivation and its consequences. So there's some terms I'll throw out. One is total sleep deprivation. That's what I showed you in the graph before. That's where you don't get any sleep in a night. Uh, there's also partial sleep deprivation or also known as short sleep. So this is when you just don't get the full seven to eight hours that is recommended. And then sleep fragmentation, which has similar results to partial sleep deprivation. And this is where you know, your total sleep time may be normal or even just slightly normal. Um, but if your sleep is fragmented, you don't go through the normal stages of sleep, you know, the non-REM sleep and REM sleep. I'm not gonna go into a lot of detail on that, um, but again, it has similar effects. And then for us, this term chronic partial sleep deprivation is what many of us experience. And something to keep in mind is, you know, when this happens, you don't get a full night of sleep for many nights in a row. You accumulate a sleep debt. You know, you can't just sleep one full night and expect all that sleep debt to get erased. It's, cum it's cumulative and it um, unites a recovery sleep to eliminate all the sleep debt. We're first gonna look at long-term effects. <clears throat> There are many. There are studies looking at links with Alzheimer's disease, obesity, diabetes, cardiovascular disease, um, all sorts of things. And we'll go through some of these. The first is obesity. Here's a graph um, with a dotted line showing how the average sleep amount of US citizens has gone down over the decades. You know, it went from nearly nine hours to somewhere between six and seven now. And then the solid black line is the obesity rates, which are you know, seen a large rise. You know, obviously sleep is not the only factor involved with this, but um, there's a chance it does play a role. In fact, if you look at um, hormones of people who are sleep deprived, um, there are changes. So ghrelin is the hormone that tells the brain you are hungry, goes up, and leptin, which is the hormone that tells the brain you are full, goes down. So you end up with this double whammy telling you to eat more. <clears throat> And they've studied this in the lab. So here's a study where they um, had people come into a sleep lab, let them just acclimate for a few days. And then the next eight days, they assigned them to either get a full night of rest or restricted their sleep by two thirds of their normal. And then they closely monitored these people. And they found that if you had short sleep, you would eat nearly 600 more kilocals per day. You know, if you think about doing this all the time, you know, that, that can really add up. You need to excess pounds. They also looked at the energy expenditure of these people and going back to this too, you know, I'm not going to talk about these studies, but there's also studies showing, um, you know, what food choices you make when you're sleep deprived. And unsurprisingly, you tend to make poorer choices with your food when you're sleep deprived. So going along with obesity is other cardiovascular risks. Um, this is a really busy graph. I'm not going to go through all of it, but you can see that your risk of stroke, um, hypertension, atherosclerosis, coronary heart disease, diabetes, it is all affected by sleep loss. And I think one interesting phenomenon that um, probably has to do with this is if you look at the number of heart attacks um, with daylight savings time, so this is a graph showing the number of heart attacks come into the emergency room <clears throat> in relation to spring daylight savings time. And that Monday after you spring forward and lose an hour of sleep if you're on a normal working schedule, 
there is a significant uptick in heart attacks. And you can look at this year after year and see this trend. In the fall, you're falling back and um, you get an extra hour of sleep. You don't see the same uptick in heart attacks. And so I don't have to tell this to Derek. He knows the importance of getting a good night's sleep and your cardiovascular health. He always wears his CPAP, so good for you, Derek. Uh, a couple more really busy graphs. I'm not gonna go through all of these, but as you can see at the top of these, sleep deprivation is there and all sorts of downstream effects can lead to um, decreased fertility in both men and women. And your fertility probably doesn't matter much if um, no one even wants to hang out with you. So this is a study looking at basically how you look um, after getting sleep deprived. They had these participants come get some headshots taken after getting a full nights of sleep for a couple nights. And then they told them to come back on another occasion after sleeping only four hours per night. They told them to not wear any makeup, wear their hair the same. The only difference really was um, the lack of sleep. Coupled all these pictures together, had over 100 um, people rate these. What they found was after being sleep deprived, people thought you were less attractive, looked less healthy, they were less willing to socialize with you, you looked more sleepy. Um, trustworthiness didn't make a difference, however. So, you know, that, that concept of getting your beauty rest probably is pretty important. No one wants to look like a raisin. All right, the immune system. So this was a really interesting study I'm gonna go through. I had over 100, I had 164 participants. And before the study, they had these participants measure how much they slept in a doctor. They also had them wear smart watches to confirm how much they were sleeping. And then they administered, administered rhinovirus into their nose and quarantined them. And for the next several weeks, they tried to objectively state that these people had a cold. They didn't just ask them about symptoms, they tried to objectively measure it. And they did that in four different ways. One was by drawing blood and looking for rhinovirus antibodies. They also would have them do nasal lavages periodically and they would do viral cultures on these. Um, and then this is kind of gross, but they would have them collect all of their mucus. Anytime they had to blow their nose, they were supposed to blow into a plastic bag and they would weigh the mucus daily. Last but not least, they would uh, measure nasociliary clearance by putting some dye in the front of the nose and seeing how fast it would get to the, the oropharynx. With all of those things, they said, did you objectively get a cold? And here are the results. So those people who were sleeping less than five hours on average, um, nearly half of them, 45%, ended up with a cold from this rhinovirus administration. If you slept more than seven hours, only you know, 15, 20% ended up with a cold. So clearly there seems to be some sort of relationship between how much you're sleeping and the strength of your immune system. <clears throat> and probably having to do with the immune system is um, the effects of cancer. So this was a mouse study out of the University of Chicago, and they injected tumor cells, cancer cells, under the skin of these mice and watched the tumors grow. And the control mice, which is SC here, um, got to sleep normally. And the sleep fragmented mice, they woke up several times in the night and um, affected their sleep. And what they found was over this 28-day study period, the tumors of the sleep fragmented mice um, were 200% on average larger than the control mice. So, you know, I think about our cancer patients who, you know, were often sticking in the ICU, getting woken up every hour to get vitals or getting flap checks. And, you know, you have to wonder if there's any effect on um, tumor growth. Hard to know. <clears throat> All right, so if the long-term effects weren't scary enough, we're now going to talk about some of the more immediate effects of sleep deprivation. And these are the things we deal with on a day-to-day -day basis and probably affect our ability to take care of patients. So one of the most well-studied things is the um, effects of memory and learning and sleep loss. So any type of memory you want to look at, um, whether it be short-term recall, long-term recall, working memory, whether it's remembering facts or remembering um, you know, episodic things, <clears throat> it's all affected. 
And just kind of the generics of how this works, and I'll kind of use a, a little bit of a computer analogy here. You see on this illustration of the brain, the blue part is the hippocampus. And this is like the short-term storage center of the brain. And it has a limited capacity, you know, so when you're first uh, making memories or learning facts, it's stored here. And it has to move out to the red parts of the brain, the neocortex, for long-term storage. And just kind of shown another way, and um, it's really not until you sleep that those memories or facts in the hippocampus are moved to the long-term storage of the neocortex. Um, and sleep also has the other benefit of refreshing the hippocampus. So you can't just keep piling in more and more information and facts there. You have to sleep to be able to kind of reset that and allow you to keep learning the next day. So here's a picture of John, ironically, sleeping during a sleep lecture. But perhaps we should be praising him for, for knowing about this and just trying to cement that knowledge to his long-term storage. One caveat to all of this is that memories associated with negative emotions are the most impervious to sleep loss. Not completely impervious, but um, slightly more impervious. And that's what this graph is showing here. So if you look at A, um, after being sleep deprived for 38 hours in this study, the black bar here, the encoding efficiency or your ability to remember facts goes down about 60%. Um, and they paired all these facts with different stimuli. So pictures of something positive, pictures of something negative, or something considered neutral. When you break these apart, you see that people were much more likely to remember these facts when it was paired with a negative stimulus. And you know, this probably has implications for us. You know, you're post-call and you're up all night. The things you're most likely to remember are the bad things, um, which probably has a negative impact on our, our mood and our overall well-being if you're just remembering all the bad things. And talking about mood, um, we know that sleep makes people more irritable and a more emotionally labile. Um, so why is this? And they've done fMRI studies to try to figure this out. So here's a fMRI study of a sleep control subject and someone who's been sleep deprived after being presented a negative stimulus. And you see in the sleep deprived subject, the amygdala is lighting up way more. We remember from med school, the amygdala is the you know, fight or flight emotional center of the brain. <clears throat> and if you look in further detail about this, you know, the amygdala is much more active because you're losing control from the prefrontal cortex. Prefrontal cortex is your executive function. You know, just because you're looking at a picture of something bad, you know, it's this executive functioning center that can say, you know what, this isn't real. I, can, I don't need to you know, jump right into a fight or flight response. Um, you can also think about this if you're, you know, some consultant is telling you something that makes you mad on the phone, your prefrontal cortex can say, hey, rein it in and let's not give a emotional response and try to be professional. And here's more fMRI studies, you know, showing this. So this is connectivity to the amygdala. You see the yellow, this is well-rested individuals have a lot of connections between their prefrontal cortex and the amygdala. The red is the sleep deprived people. And you see lots of connectivity straight to the brain stem, to your autonomic center. So these people are just primed for a fight or flight response. And having to do with the lack of prefrontal uh, cortex control is this uh, risk-taking behavior. <clears throat> this is a study, had 48 participants and they had them do this Iowa gambling task on two different occasions. One when they were well rested, and then a second time after sleep depriving them for quite a long time, we'll say 50 hours. Um, and the way this gambling task works is you it's a game. You basically just click on one of these card decks and it flips over and you either win or you lose money. And two of these decks are favorable and they're favorable because they're less risky. So you flip over a card, if you win money, it's not a ton of money, but if you lose money, you don't lose a whole lot. And overall, if you keep selecting from the favorable decks, you win more money over time. The other two are considered unfavorable. They're much riskier, so there's high dollar amounts in there for winning and losing. And it's designed to make you lose more money overall if you select from those decks. And so here are the results. 
So the light gray line with the white circles is um, their baseline. You can see over time, once you get to hands 81 to 100, they're pretty much exclusively selecting from the favorable decks. They've learned as the game goes on that stay away from those risky decks. Um, but something changes when they're sleep deprived. So the squares here, the first half of the game, they're doing pretty well and um, picking the less risky ones, but halfway through they start um, just sampling from whatever. And the triangles here is uh, actually trauma patients who have injury to their prefrontal cortex. And you kind of see a similar pattern between these two. And they've also looked at fMRI studies of this of risk, -take, risk taking behavior. And you will see that they have less prefrontal cortex activation um, when doing um, tasks like this. So certainly has implications when you're on call. You, you know, no one wants to be taking unnecessary risks when you're taking care of patients. <clears throat> All right, so a lot of us are surgeons here on this call. So how does sleep deprivation affect your motor skills? I liked the title of this study, Practice with Sleep Makes Perfect. And in this study, they had participants basically just type out these keyboard tasks. They had these same series of numbers, and they just had to um, try to type out as many as they could as fast as they could. First group, they had them come in at 10 a.m. to do this. And they let them practice a little bit and then did a post test to see how many sequences they could do in 30 seconds. Then they had them come back 12 hours later at 10 p.m. and do the same thing. And really they performed about the same. Uh, then they were said to go home, get a good full eight hours of sleep and come back and do the test again. And lo and behold, 10, 10 a.m. the next day, they were much better, much more fluid and faster at these keyboard um, tasks. Um, group C was essentially the same as group B, except they made them wear mittens the whole time um, in between the tests just so they can, I guess, like practice in their head. And group D, something a little different. So they did their first training at 10 p.m. Then they went right home, got to go sleep full eight hours, and lo and behold, the next morning they were um, much more fluid. Um, to account for some circadian rhythm differences, perhaps, they had them come back again at 10 p.m. and do it again, and they were still better. So this study kind of shows, you know, there seems to be something to do with sleeping and um, kind of mastering these motor skills. And, you know, for us in the OR, you know, if we don't get a good night of sleep afterwards, you wonder how much we're actually um, improving. All right, alertness and awareness. So again, this is another very well-studied part of sleep deprivation. This picture I'm showing you here is a computer monitor with a red dot. And this is the passive vigilance test, which is used a lot in sleep literature. And it's a very simple task. This red dot comes up and you just push a button saying you've acknowledged the red. And it's random, it comes up anywhere between two and 10 seconds. So if you sleep deprive people over time, um, they start to do worse. You can look at reaction times and that's impaired, but this graph is actually looking at performance lapses. So you just completely miss the dot. You don't push the button at all. And whether that's just because you're not paying attention or you've um, experienced something called a micro sleep. Uh, and you can see here the first 18 to 20 hours, people do just fine. You know, red dot comes up, they can push a button, no problem. But as you start keeping people awake longer and longer, they start just missing the dot. There's a little bit of undulations here in the graph. Again, you can um, chalk that up to the circadian rhythm. You know, you get those peaks of alertness midday, which um, lets you do a little bit better. But over time, you're going to keep doing worse and worse. And what's pretty scary when you look at this data is, you know, what I showed you before, if you've done an all-nighter, um, on average, it, you end up with a 400% increase in missed responses. Well, they've done the same test after just um, partially sleep depriving people. And when they sleep deprive people to only four hours of sleep, once they hit the sixth night, they're performing like they've done an all-nighter. So they hit that 400% 400 threshold. What about six hours of sleep? So once you hit day 10 of uh, six hours of sleep, you're performing like you've done an all-nighter. So I think that's kind of scary. I think a lot of us probably only get six hours of sleep. 
And one reason this is really scary is um, if you're having to drive in a car after um, missing out on sleep. So this shows here, if you sleep less than four hours per night, your risk of being in a car crash nearly 12 times. And then I've looked at this uh, among, among residents. So this is a study out of Harvard where they asked interns, um, have you nodded asleep, nodded off or fallen asleep while driving or while being stopped in traffic? And if you've worked a whole bunch of extended shifts in a row, your odds ratio go, goes way up to saying yes to these questions, 2.39 and 3.69. And there's many studies out there. I'm not going to go through all of them, but um, looking at driving safety. Here's some smart residents being passengers in a car when they're sleep deprived. Don't get behind the wheel if you're too sleepy. All right, something a little less dangerous, but also potentially very impactful is getting a needle stick. This was a large study, nearly 3,000 interns. Um, and their odds ratio of being um, stuck with a needle was 1.6 um, when working an extended overnight shift compared to a normal shift. <clears throat> all right, so this is a study out of Australia, and I think it kind of put all of this stuff that I'm telling you into um, a pretty interesting context, basically comparing sleep deprivation to being drunk. So they had these participants come on two separate occasions, once while um, sleep depriving them and having them do a series of cognitive and motor tasks, and then another time when they um, got them progressively more drunk. And what they found was after 17 to 19 hours of being awake, their performance was equivalent or worse than having a 0.05% blood alcohol level. And they kept these people. And so you look at all this data and you realize, you know, how important sleep is and how it can affect us. And, you know, especially if you're an outside person looking at residency training, you know, they wonder why is it like this? Why do they get so little rest? And a lot of people point their fingers at this guy. Uh, this is Dr. Halstead, who was a surgeon at Johns Hopkins when kind of medical training was um, being established in the United States. And he gets a lot of the credit for kind of what modern residencies look like. And this guy had a, you know, a relentless work ethic and could operate at all hours of the day, of the day and expected his residents to do the same. Um, but they have come to learn that this guy was actually um, very addicted to cocaine and that might have explained why he could work with so little sleep. Um, fortunately, he was able to go to rehab and largely kick his cocaine habit by instead doing morphine every day. So now I'm going to circle back to that Libby Zion case. Um, so with all these things I've learned and studied, you know, you do wonder if, you know, the resident being awake for 18 hours contributed um, to her death. It's hard to know. Um, and this happened in, you know, 1984, but really there weren't, you know, widespread changes to duty hours um, until much, much later, as we'll see. You know, there were some local changes, you know, this hospital in particular, and some states came up with some guidelines. Um, but really, the, you know, nothing official for all specialties from the ACGME until 2003. And this came out in 1999 to air as human, um, and they estimated that there's nearly you know, 98,000 deaths per year, uh, strictly as a result of medical errors. And, you know, and in this, they talk about, you know, working long hours and sleep deprivation a little bit, but it's hard to, you know, exactly quantify this. You know, how do you say, was this a direct result of being sleep deprived? And uh, this is kind of the best stuff I could find is really just surveys. So here's a survey of, you know, 3,600 residents 
how much do you think you sleep on average? And then, you know, do you think you made a medical error because of sleep loss? And you see people who are saying they sleep less than four hours per night, you know, nearly 45% of them said yes, they think they made a sleep-related error. Maybe a little more objective is, is this one, this, you know, have you been involved with the malpractice suit? And again, you can see people who are sleeping less um, were more likely to be involved in a malpractice suit. Again, here's another survey looking at um, residents as well as attendings and saying, hey, do you think you made a medical error because of either burnout or lack of sleep or a combination of the two? And uh, quite a few residents said yes to this, you know, 15, 20%. Um, and attendings as well, you know, nearly 10% think they've probably made a sleep related error or burnout error. So our attendings are not um, immune to this. This brings us to our ACGME duty hour requirements. So in 2003, they made this um, universal across all, all subspecialties that the duty hour cap was 80 hours in a week on average. And you could only work 24 hours at a time. 2011, they did amend this a little bit. So the 80 hours stayed the same, but they said first year residents should only work 16 hours. Uh, and a lot of part of the reason they made this change was many of those studies that I had listed in that um, chart earlier. A lot of those studies were amongst interns. So they thought, you know, maybe interns um, are a little more sensitive to, to sleep loss. Um, but they actually changed their mind about that in 2017. So now everyone can work 24 hours again. And I love this other edition they had in 2011, which was. Um, programs are to encourage residents to use alertness management strategies and strategic napping is strongly suggested. So Anya is taking advantage of that suggestion. And I tried to say, you know, what is this alertness management strategy? What is this? Uh, and I came to found that UT Southwestern actually has a, a policy on this. And so we're going to go through it since it's actually a requirement. Here it is signed by David Weigel of the alertness management fatigue mitigation policy. So first thing it says is the program must provide information and instruction on recognizing the signs of fatigue and sleep deprivation. And hopefully we've done some of that already, but here's some more. So symptoms, fatigue, mood changes, difficulty concentrating, memory problems, and I guess in very severe cases, paranoia and hallucinations. And then some warning signs, you know, falling asleep, during this lecture, um, being restless and irritable with staff, having to check your work repeatedly, um, difficulty focusing on patient care, and also just feeling burnt out. The program will provide alertness management fatigue medication processes. Uh, this is a little bit of a harder one to find concrete examples for. Um, these are the best things I could find. So strategic napping again, um, that's the one that comes up time and time again. If you have a moment to, you know, catch a little nap, that's probably a good idea. Um, strategic caffeine consumption. So taking caffeine in the morning is, you know, possibly a good idea, especially if you've been sleep deprived recently. Um, but obviously, you don't want to go crazy with caffeine and um, have it affect your ability to sleep at night. And again, not a whole lot of detail here, but maximizing sleep periods before and after sleep loss. So if you can anticipate when you're going to have sleep loss, you know you're about to be on call. Ensuring you get good nights of sleep flanking those call days. Um, pretty um, common sense there, but important. And then having good sleep hygiene. So again, you can maximize those sleep periods. And just a reminder, what is good sleep hygiene? So trying to have a good nighttime routine creating a healthy sleep environment, so a cool, dark room, um, not using electronics and screens right before bed, avoiding large fatty meals, and then overall just having good, you know, health, exercise, reducing your stress. It can be accomplished using visual presentations, lectures, et cetera. So here you go. 
All right, what next? So we need a process to ensure continuity of patient care. And I think we do a pretty good job in our residency of doing this. You know, we have a good call system so far, and I think we give pretty good sign out to each other and ensure our patients are being um, well cared for and there's no gaps. And ensuring adequate sleep facilities. So in Clements, you know, it's on the fourth floor, but that's our call room number there. Um, at Parkland, I think we have the, you know, the Bruce Mickey and Barbara Schultz suite for us to use. And that's, there's this suite room with bunk beds. So if, you know, Pamela and Dota are taking buddy call, they don't have to be separated at all. You can rent this room. And there's always the lovely Parkland cat, well utilized. All right, continuing on. So transportation options for residents requesting assistance. So if you really um, feel unsafe to drive home after being up all night, um, you can call a taxi and the department will reimburse you. I confirmed with Dr. Marple, he's happy to put that bill if you really think um, you need to take a Lyft or Uber home. Another great option is just to ask one of your co-residents, you know, there's probably somebody well rested out there who's happy to give you a ride. Camilla may even pick you up in a Range Rover, who knows. And then this I think is the hardest part of the procedure and policy here, is the program needs to balance your educational opportunities with um, times for rest and personal activities. So, you know, especially after you know, a long night of call, you know, part of you really wants to go to sleep, but the other part of you really wants to not miss out on being, you know, in the operating room and, and learning. So this is the, the, the struggle I think we deal with on a day-to-day -day basis is, um, you know, missing out on clinical opportunities and, you know, missing out on helping the team. And the very end here, there is a grievance um, policy that's a separate policy if you um, have any issues with any of these things. Final thoughts. So sleep is essential. There's numerous long-term health consequences and there's all sorts of immediate health effects that um, probably affect our ability to perform on a day-to-day -day basis and may impact our, our patients. And then if you, you know, feel like you need to get some rest, you know, please let your team know, let your seniors know. Again, I'm, I'm much more cognizant about this now that I'm not in um, the primary call pool and I see how sleepy and tired people are. So just let us know if you, if you need a break and then stay safe. Don't drive if you're too sleepy. All right, any questions?